right. So, church is not a spectator sport. I need you to help me out a little bit today. So, you got to think quick. The, the, nine, uh, the nine o'clock crowd did a pretty good job, even though they didn't have as much coffee into them as you probably have and weren't up for as long. So, this is, I'm going to report back to them how well you did. I'm going to see if the 11.15 crowd can beat the nine o'clock crowds. So I've got some questions for you. You've got to think quick on this. So how many of you put up your hand if you've only ever been to the country of Canada? Never been anywhere else. You've only ever been to Canada. A grand total of zero, which is no surprise because we're in a border city, right? So it'd be kind of weird if you're like, ah, I've never been to Detroit. So how many of you have only ever been to Canada or the U.S.? Hands up. Only Canada or the U.S.? Okay. Now, let's stretch this out a little bit. How many of you have been to at least five countries? Five countries. Hands up. Okay, keep them up if you've been to 10 countries. 15. Okay, I'm at 15, so my hand's going to go down. How about 20? 20 countries. Okay, 25 countries. 30? 35? 40? So, wow, okay, she, Annabella wins, okay? We had a guy at the 9 o'clock service, he'd been at 25 countries, she's 35 to 40, so let's give her a hand. All right. <laughs> Next set of questions is going to be a lot easier. How many of you know people from five countries? Ten. You've met people from 15 countries. 20, 25, 30, 35, 40... Okay, come on, your hands should be way up. We live in Canada. So if you haven't met people from at least 100 100 countries, I don't know what's wrong with you, right? Because here's the reality. We live in an extremely unique time in history. Literally, the world lives in our city. People from all over the world live in our city and live on our streets. And so it's totally normal for us in a given week to meet or interact without even thinking about it from people from dozens and dozens and dozens of countries. Now, whenever something's familiar, you kind of take it for granted after after a while. But I just want to remind us how absolutely unique that is at this particular point in human history. For us to live in a city where we literally rub shoulders every week or see people from all over the world, and where we have people in our church that have traveled like 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 countries. That is an incredible thing. And in the Gospels, we're going to be reminded today of Jesus' heart for the world. Jesus did not spend all his ministry just hanging out with his clan ministering to people that shared his DNA. Jesus was very interested in the Gentiles, those that were non-Jews. And so if you read the gospel and you're thinking that every time Jesus is doing ministry, he's just ministering to Jews, you're, you're, you're actually misreading the gospels because the heart of Christ for the world comes through loud and clear. So what is our mission as a church? We often remind ourselves of our mission. Here's what our mission is not. Our mission as a church is not to try to get everyone else from all the other churches to attend our church. That's not our mission. It's not what we're about. Now, if there are people from other churches that refuse in those churches to obey the Great Commission, the commandment and commission that Christ gave to us to share the gospel, and they they can't make a difference. Maybe they should come here. But our goal is not to attract people from other churches. Our mission is not to identify in our culture the most attractive, the most intelligent, the most moral, the most committed, and say, well, you're the people we want to go after. Now, we want those kind of people to come here. But we also want to go after people that are not attractive, that are not moral, that are not committed, that don't have a clue, and frankly, right now, aren't even interested in Jesus Christ. Our mission 
is not just to reach our own families. We all, I'm sure, want our families to come to know the Lord Jesus. But our mission is not just to get the kids and the wife to the point of salvation. We want to see the world one for Jesus Christ. So what's our mission? Well, you know, our mission statement is to glorify God. That's the vertical. To glorify God through the fulfillment of the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is that sort of summary statement that Jesus offered his disciples at the tail end of Matthew, Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, where he commissioned us. He's like, hey guys, I'm leaving. I want you to go into all the world Preach the gospel, baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. By the way, I'm going to be with you through all of that. That's what we call the Great Commission. That's our mission. And when it comes to the application of the Great Commission, you mustn't think that Jesus just ministered to Jews, ministered to Jews, ministered to Jews, and then all of a sudden he's like, yeah, I want you to go minister to the Gentiles. Rather, in Jesus' earthly ministry, we see him very much putting the Great Commission into practice before he'd even given it to us. So we're in a sermon series called Simply Following Jesus, right? We're looking at the Gospel of Mark. And this series is going to be useless to you if you don't increasingly conform your mindset, your attitudes, your actions to the patterns of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to follow Jesus then, which I do, and I know so many of you are passionate about, then what we just need to be reminded of is that Jesus is interested in the world. So this is a simple message this morning. It's a fundamental message. It's sort of a a clarion call, so to speak, calling us back to one of the fundamental activities that should mark out every healthy church and every healthy Christian. So what we're going to see here very simply, Jesus is loving on Gentiles. And if Jesus is loving on Gentiles, and I'm simply called to follow Jesus, then here's the application for us. I'll just spill the beans right up front. It should be us loving on people outside of our normal spheres. So your normal sphere might be your family. It might be white people. It might be Asian people. It might be black people, depending on your background. It might be men. It might be women. It might be moral people. It might be engineers or teachers or tradesmen. But perhaps Jesus is calling you to expand your sphere a little bit and to reach people who aren't quite like you, people that you wouldn't normally gravitate toward. You might actually be somewhat repulsed by them to expand your sphere. And your sphere will not be expanded, we're going to see this in the text, unless your heart is expanded and become becomes like Christ's. So this is not a task message. This is a heart message. And it calls us to soften our hearts so that the world might know. Some of us think it's easier to reach moral people, by the way. It's not. It's not easier to reach moral people. Because moral people are hard to convince that they need grace. But in Jesus' ministry, we see him reaching people way outside the norm. And the opposite then was also true. The people that were really religious and moral were his chief opponents. Isn't that weird? They were always out to get him, to take him down, because he didn't measure up to their standards. So here we have it. We're going to go to Mark 7. And we're going to look at verses 24 to 37. What you'll see there is there's two different episodes. We're going to learn something from each of them, but they also have something in common. And we're going to begin with verses 24 to 30. I'm just going to say right up front, this is probably one of, in a growing way, my favorite passages in the Bible. I'm always reluctant to say anything's my favorite passage because it's all God's word. You know what I mean? So I don't want to diminish any other passage. But I, I just, I love this passage because it captures in such a clear way the heart of the gospel. It's just so central to what we're about. And so if you have a Bible and you, and you like kind of writing things in your margin, you might put something in there like, this is one of the greatest faith accounts of the Bible. 
Because it is. So, so here we have it. Verse 24, Jesus is ministering in Israel. And verse 24 says, And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Pause. Bible students, I got a question for you. Tyre and Sidon. In Israel or outside of Israel? Outside, outside correct. Give her a gold star or something. A free mug at the communication center. Correct. It's outside of Israel. So Jesus is moving outside into what territory? Gentile territory. There's probably a few Jews living in the cities too, but this was Gentile territory. So then you need to look at the verb arose. And that just tells us that Jesus took the initiative to go where Jews normally don't go. That's kind of cool. He took the initiative. So takeaway, quick takeaway. Do I really have to preach it? Or can you connect the dots for yourself? We need to take the initiative to go to those that are lost. We don't just sit in our hands and hope they show up in our church. So let's then move on. He entered a house and he did not want anyone to know he's tired out. Ministry is exhausting. I mean, it involves the mind, the mouth, the eyes, the hands, the feet, the heart, the soul. It's exhausting. Jesus was exhausted, just pouring himself out day after day into people's lives. Just exhausted. You're like, well, he's God. How can he be exhausted? Because he's also 100% human. So he's exhausted. He's trying to get away. And yet, he could not be hidden. So mental note, ministry is never convenient. Is that helpful for some of you? Oh, I schedule my evangelistic appointments on Wednesday nights. Yeah, good luck with that. Ministry is not convenient. So Jesus might have been taking a sabbatical. Time off from intense ministry is necessary, but sometimes you just don't get it. You try to get it, but you don't always get it. Look at verse 25 then. But immediately, so how much time did Jesus get to chill out? Zero. Immediately, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him. She didn't see him. She hadn't met him before. He wasn't her relative. She hadn't watched him on TBN. She'd never seen Jesus before, but she heard about him. Somebody had testified to her about Jesus, and she came and fell down at his feet. When you fall down at someone's feet, there's only two possibilities. You either tripped or you're paying homage. I think she was paying homage. But she'd only ever heard of him. But somehow, her heart had been stirred and she started to worship Jesus. Everything up till now, by the way, is relatively normal when you look at Jesus' ministry. This is not a particularly unusual account up to and including verse 25. But from verse 26 on, it gets very abnormal. So you ready for this? Here's what I want you to do. You know the game of baseball, strike one, strike two, strike three, you're out. So look at the passage. Now the woman, so you have to say strike one, was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician. Okay, so she's out. Because male Jewish rabbis shouldn't be ministering to women, to women who are Gentiles, to women who are Syrophoenicians. And that's what makes this abnormal, but it gets even stranger. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. It's totally okay for you to gasp right now. This is Jesus. And properly understood, this is a rather offensive, shall we just say rude, statement for Jesus to make to a woman 
who's asking him to heal her little girl. We're going to come back to it. She answers, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone, praise the Lord. And then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decapolis. Decapolis in Israel or outside of Israel? Outside. So he, the whole episode, both episodes we're going to look at, it's Jesus ministering to Gentiles. Let's think about what we've been reading here. So the problem is this woman, this unexpected woman, comes into Jesus' life and her daughter is demon-possessed. Jesus had encountered demon-possessed people before. But what's unusual about this is his response. Jesus says to her, let the children be fed first. You're like, what, what children? You're... Your children? Like, what, who's he talking about here? Of course we feed kids first at the table because they're always the hungriest, right? Is that what he's talking about? What about the crumbs? I don't, I, don't, I don't get it. What's in her response? Here's what Jesus is saying. You ready for this? You need to take the statements of the verse and interpret them. Who are the children? Israel. What's the bread? It's the gospel. The gospel declared, the gospel lived out, Jesus' healing touch. Who is the dog? She's the dog. Think about that. Jesus identifies a derogatory, uses a derogatory word that we were used by Jews to refer to Gentiles as Gentile dogs and calls this woman a dog to her face. Ladies, would you appreciate that? Wouldn't appreciate it, right? Guys, you wouldn't appreciate it either. And in my humanness, if I were that woman, I, here's what I would probably do. How rude. Like a girl. How rude. <laughs> like a guy. How rude. Get out of here. Right? Like who? Are you kidding me? And I'd stomp out and I'd tell my friend who testified to me about Jesus. Like, why would you ever send me to this guy? He is the rudest preacher I've ever met. So she's the dog. Jesus is offering bread. The children of Israel are the children. Look at the statement again. Let the children, let Israel be fed first, for it is not right to take the gospel and throw it to the Gentile. This is what makes this passage incredibly encouraging. She answers him, yes, next word, Lord. Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. We can so relate to this. We have a dog. And my wife has informed me that ever since we've got our dog, about four years ago, she rarely has to sweep up anymore. Because anytime there's a food item on the floor, that dog will just sniff around and pick it right up. You still got to sweep up hair and dust. But the dog gets literally all the food off the floor. So Jesus essentially, she comes to Jesus with a request. He pushes back. She steps back and she gets down in her spirit. She calls him Lord. And her response is essentially this. You're right, I'm a dog. And I do not deserve any of your bread. But would you mind if I at least snooped around under the table for a while and picked up a few crumbs? Is that not like an incredible statement from this woman? I mean, here, here we have, brothers and sisters, true saving faith. The woman heard about Jesus and came to him in faith. Jesus then pushes back and she still demonstrates faith and surrender by virtue of the fact that she called him her Lord. And this squares up with Romans 10, 17, which says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. 
There's something about the gospel when it is heard that has the ability to transform. It's also a good reminder to us that we don't just trust Jesus because he's doing a lot of awesome things in our lives that are tangible, that are physical, that we can touch, that we can taste, that we can smell, that we can kind of grab hold of. When the gospel goes out in power and it is preached with clarity and urgency, the gospel has the capacity to convince people in a way that none of us can. And obviously the spirit had gone ahead of Christ and worked in this woman's heart. And her initial response and then her response to his pushback demonstrate she in fact was a true daughter of God. And Jesus' response then in verse 29 is telling. He says, for this statement... So she didn't do anything, but she declared it with her mouth. And this ties into our theology that belief is expressed through proclamation. We're not saved because we do anything. We're saved when we realize we can't do anything, but we profess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And God does a regenerative work in our lives that religion can't do and pastors can't do and your best friend can't do and your family can't do and reading a lot of Bible can't do. God does what only God can do. So we have here an incredible demonstration of faith. I think her response, too, admittedly, is a genius response. Well, even the dogs get to eat crumbs. Just give me a few meager leftovers. Now, this is not a passage here. Oh, okay, there's somebody outsmarted Jesus. Jesus is like, no, I never thought about that. That's not what this is about. She didn't outsmart Jesus, but Jesus put her in a position so that those listening and we reading 2,000 years later could hear her plea for grace. So what is the essence of repentance? Repentance is more than saying you're sorry. What is the essence of repentance and salvation? It's a plea for grace with no excuses, with no anger, with no self-righteousness. Check, check, check. I'm good with those three. Okay, let's give you a fourth. You may not be quite so good with this because it rubs me the wrong way. With no sense of entitlement attached. With no sense of entitlement attached. It's one thing to go to Jesus and say, hey, I heard you're into grace, heard you're into mercy. I'm kind of broken up. I think I need it. But to go to Jesus realizing that it's his prerogative to even offer that, he doesn't even owe it to you if you ask for it. I mean, that's kind of, kind of humbling. And we see that in this woman. There's no, enti- no entitlement attached. Jesus is essentially, well, you don't deserve it. She's like, you're right, I don't. But please give it to me. And Jesus is like, because of your faith, I'm going to give it to you. Makes me ask myself the question, even as a Christian, do I have an entitlement mindset when it comes to God? Like, do I have this weird, sinful thinking in my head that says, yeah, God owes me something. I mean, look at all I've done for him. (laughs) It's so easy to, in a world where you do and someone pays you or you do and you get, to think that's the way it works with God too. If I do, he owes me something. God owes you a grand total of zero. But when we plea, we're in that place where, yeah, we don't, we don't deserve it, Lord. We, I, I really don't deserve it. I'm just begging you by your grace to give it. More often than not, God's like, then here it is. That's what I wanted to hear. And that's just such a refresh, refreshing message for us. Jesus says, for this statement, you may go. And, by the way, The demon has left your daughter. Jesus doesn't even go to the daughter. He just heals her by his words. I don't know how far away she was. A couple rooms, a couple blocks, half a city away. I don't know. But Jesus declares her to be well. She runs out the door and surprise, surprise, when she gets to her daughter, her daughter has been made well. Well, this passage begs the question, how to test the authenticity of your faith. You want to make sure you got real faith? Let let me give you a few things. Let me give you three things that will help you to test the authenticity of your faith. Number one, when you know that grace is unearned. When you know 
that grace is unearned. Secondly, when you know that healing is not deserved. Mental healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing, physical healing, whatever it might be. It's not deserved. God is not a genie in a bottle. Rub the bottle, pops out. What do I need to do for you today? It's not deserved. It's an act of grace. Third, Christ is not obliged to pay attention to you. Does the Bible say Christ came to save the lost? It does. But it says something else too. It says he came to seek and to save the lost. Because by nature, we're not particularly interested. So Christ is not obliged to pay attention to you. So if you have this like fairsy squaresy doctrine, it's all fairsy squaresy. Whatever Jesus does for my buddy, he has to do for me. No, he doesn't. Well, I asked for it. So he has to provide. I found a promise somewhere in the Bible as my proof text. No. If you have this fairsy squaresy doctrine of Jesus, you're not going to feel particularly comfortable with what you read in the Bible. Because God's notion of fairness is very different than ours. God grants salvation and seeks us out by his grace. And the more comfortable you feel with that, the more your worship will increase. The less comfortable you feel with that, the more diminished your worship life will be. Because we have a God that seeks us out when we are lost. And hey, once you've been a Christian for a long time, you're rather appreciative of that because you know that your propensity is not to seek him very often. So that's, that's that. Now let's move on then. Who should we evangelize? We have Tyre, Sidon. We mentioned Decapolis, but we didn't find out what happened there. They're all Gentile majorities. Maybe there was some Jews living there, but they were Gentile majorities, and Jesus evidently wants to reach those people too. So instead of just reaching the attractive, those that already knew him, maybe his cousins and second cousins and third cousins and all that, his neighbors, Jesus goes a little bit of a distance. And by the way, reading the Bible, you're like, yeah, he went to Tyre, went to Sidon, went to Decapolis. You're like, oh, he did that all in a day. Like, look at a map. He's walking. This is like a long, these are pretty hefty journeys, right? So we're talking modern day Lebanon down into the Jordan, the country of Jordan, where where these locations would be today. So that's a little bit of a hike cross country. You can imagine probably took a while, but Jesus was willing to burn those calories to get to people. So healing episode two, verse 32. So he's in Decapolis. Now they brought to him a man who had two problems. He was deaf and he had a speech impediment and they begged him to lay hands on, his hand on him, curious response, and taking him aside from the crowd privately, okay, this is where it gets a little weird, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue, yuck, and looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephaphatha, it's an unusual word, that is be opened, And his ears were opened, and his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. So back to verse 32, he was deaf, had a speech impediment. Verse 35, his ears were open, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. So both of his problems are solved by Christ. Jesus charges them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it, and they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well, He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Let's unpack this. Let's enter into it. A guy can't hear and he has some sort of a speech impediment. His tongue is tied up somehow. Act number one. Jesus takes him away from the crowd privately. Question, why? Think about it. Probably for two reasons. First, after the healing, he says, I don't want you to tell a lot of people. So it would appear that maybe taking him aside, Jesus was hoping to 
protect a lot of people from seeing it because Jesus wanted people to primarily identify him as their Lord and their Savior, not first and foremost as their physical healer. One's temporary, one's eternal. Therefore, the eternal is more important. So Jesus takes them aside, I think in part because of the statement that comes after, but I also suspect if you add that to Jesus' actions that he wanted some alone time with this guy. So think back to the girl in Tyre. Jesus heals her from a distance. You're like, oh, that's how we do evangelism. We just go on the radio. We just do web announcements. We send letters. We flyer the neighborhood and hope no one's standing on the front lawn, right? Like this kind of distance evangelism. And that can work and that can bear fruit. And Jesus does that in a certain way in Tyre and Sidon. But now he takes the man aside. It's just him and the man. And as he's interacting with this man, we see that it gets very, very personal. So the, the man's problem is he can't hear. So Jesus takes his fingers And I don't think it was a wet willy, but he takes his fingers and he puts them in the man's ears. Now, I wouldn't want to put my fingers in any of your ears, especially the ones that have hair growing out of them. But this is what Jesus does. He puts his fingers in this man's ears. Like, wouldn't words, do you think Jesus could have healed him by by his words? Yeah, he healed the girl by his words, but now there's that up-close personal touch And it's like Jesus is doing something that's innately uncomfortable to show this man that he's stepping his way. He's willing to put himself into an awkward position in order to demonstrate grace to this man. But then it comes the man's turn. Jesus like licks his finger, spits on it, open your mouth, say, ah, what would your reaction be? Oh, no, just say it. But the man leans in and Jesus touches his tongue with his saliva. And it seems to me then that we see two unnatural acts portraying a supernatural exchange. Jesus comes his way and then he puts his finger out and the man leans in and allows him to touch his tongue. Doesn't this tell us so much about the nature of faith and the pastoral heart of the Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus wasn't just a preacher. He was also a pastor par excellence. And he demonstrates just this love and compassion for this man. And then to add to that, the text says, and looking up to heaven, so there's the vertical. He's clearly relying upon the Father, the will of the Father to do through him what he's willfully surrendered himself to do. And he sighed. Why did he sigh? It's like, (sighs) what makes you sigh? (sighs) Maybe you just ran a long race and you're tired. But we also tend to sigh at that which burdens our hearts. And in his humanity, Jesus' heart is burdened for lost people. So he sighs. And... In that moment, then, we see the humanity of Christ once again. What makes you sigh? Sin makes me mad. And the Bible has a place for holy anger. But the sin and brokenness of our world should also make us sigh. More babies were aborted this week. Another person died apart from Christ. That person just walked away from Christianity. (sighs) Really? You'll never be effective in ministry unless you have the heart of Christ increasingly growing in you. You can learn the skills, what to say and how to unpack it and the 10 steps to evangelism and you can have the little track in your pocket with the prayer that someone's supposed to pray after and sign off in the bottom. But if you don't have a heart for people, the heart of Christ, and if that person's heart has not been softened by the Lord, the results are going to be abysmal. So here we have, I think another, it's not a commandment, it's not an imperative, but it's an example 
of the soft-heartedness that Christ wants us to have for lost people. Now, the word gets out and people are astonished. Jesus had told them to be quiet, but they weren't quiet. They were probably a little more interested in his healing power than his lordship and status as savior. We should always make sure that we're more excited about Jesus' status as savior and lord than healer. And here's why. You know, a lot of churches, there's debate about healing, and I've taught about taught about that here in our church many times in different venues. Um, But regardless of where you arrive in your conclusions, one thing that should always thrill you far more than physical healing is Christ's identity as your Savior. Because that's eternal. That's forever. So all Christians, Christians may have different viewpoints on physical healing or the role of physical healers. I personally believe that physical healing is for today. I don't believe that any Christian has the power to heal by themselves. But that's an aside. If you disagree with me on that, oh well, I'm not going to lose sleep tonight. But I I would lose sleep if you're like, I don't think Jesus is my Savior or my Lord, because that's like fundamental to who we are. So let's make sure our churches are centered on that rather than a peripheral issue it really only has implications for 70 years of our lives or so, and then really doesn't matter because we're going to be ultimately healed with the Lord and resurrected in the end anyway. We never want to lose sight of Jesus' primary role as our Savior and Lord. So here's a couple lessons for us to take home this afternoon. Number one, and this is just going to blow your mind. It's just so profound. Simply following Jesus requires that we reach people. Just kidding. It's not profound. It's just very simple. This is like foundational level Christianity. Simply following Jesus, that's Mark, means that we need to reach people. Get it? We need to reach people. It's not an option. It's not peripheral. It's not a footnote. It's not once I've been saved for 18 years. It's part of who we are. And here are four things, then, that will help you to do that. Number one, you need to pray for the lost. Why do we pray for the lost? Because we're told to pray for the lost? Oh, yeah, because we want to be obedient. But what are we doing when we're praying for the lost? We're calling for God to manifest himself in that person's life, to show up, to convict, to soften the heart, to illuminate the mind, to bring about conversion. So we pray for the lost because we know that human beings have no capacity to change the inside of another person. Only God has the capacity to do that. So we pray for the lost. I hope that you have a, as part of your prayer life, not just gimme, gimme, Lord, kind of talk, but you have a hey, Lord, I've been talking to this person at work or I have this family member or there's this person I've brought to church and they don't know you and I just, I'm just praying that you would soften their heart and do it. Hey, that, that brings out a lot of relief to the evangelism process because you just kind of remind yourself it's not about you, but hey, God also does what only God can do. Secondly, let's look for and slash create opportunities. So this week, we created ourselves an opportunity. We like put money and time and energy and months of planning into a kids camp. So we created an opportunity for unbelievers to come here. And the Lord enabled us to bear fruit. Other times, the Lord just gives you an opportunity. You weren't even looking for it. Maybe a colleague at work or someone in crisis or a neighbor that goes through some sort of a life-altering event. So God's given you the opportunity. And those of us that have been Christians for a long time know about the failed opportunities Maybe we just weren't thinking about it, we weren't focused in, and later we're like, oh, I could have just shared my faith with that person. It wasn't even on my radar. So you need to pray, pray for opportunities and look for them. Ask guys, God to open your heart so that you might reach people for Christ. How about this one? Share your testimony, your story, how God has transformed you. Why is that important? Where do I get that from in this text? 
Because both people that Jesus had healed heard about him from someone else first. I'll just call that a testimony. Somebody had testified to God's work through Christ, and they heard it, and that testimony piqued their interest and brought them to Christ. So never underestimate the power of you sharing your testimony to bring people toward Christ. And if you're a believer then, and you've been saved for longer than a week, I just made that up, a week, you should be able to share your testimony in one minute, in five minutes, and in one hour. So the long form, the quick form, and the really quick form. So make sure that you are clear on what your testimony is. What, what really matters is going to go into the one minute. A little more is going to go into the five minute. And then if you have time to sit around with someone at Starbucks and talk for like an hour, give them the whole thing. The life before, the life during, the, the event during, the, your life after, different trials and tribulations. Share your testimony and just let God use it as he sees fit. And then fourth reminder... Don't try fixing people's morals first. Preach the gospel. Well, they're not ready to go to church. Why? Because they're still an absolute drunk and cocaine addict. Great. There's an empty chair. Bring them in. Don't feel that you have to fix people's problems first before you expose them to the gospel. Because a couple things. Their problems are all fixed, but they don't know Jesus. At the end of the day, where are they going? hell. Secondly, we're not about moralizing people. This is going to be helpful for those of you that maybe have studied world religions. It's very easy to take all other world religions and drop them into one basket. Biblical Christianity is in its own basket. Because biblical Christianity and biblical Christianity alone requires a renovation of the heart in order to believe. All the other religions are either not concerned with the heart or you kind of do a lot of things and the heart eventually follows along. Biblical Christianity requires a renovation of the heart. So we're not about fixing people's problems. We want to be agents of redemption in a world. We want to push back against legislation or laws or notions that are unbiblical because they just create more barriers and confusion and they destroy people's lives. But first and foremost, we're agents of gospel. We're not agents of moral virtue. So when you're evangelizing, don't get, don't get too worked up about some of the things you see in unbelievers' lives. Just preach the gospel and let God do what God can only do. So that's the gospel part. The second lesson, so lesson number one, simply following Jesus requires us to reach people. Lesson number two, and this is just for us to find great joy in, Jesus is a gracious healer. Again, not super profound, but awesome. Jesus is a gracious healer, and let us never forget that all of us have been dramatically healed who know the Lord. And in fact, if you're here today and you're alive, chances are Jesus has also physically healed you of a few things along the way to keep you going to this point. Maybe things you weren't even aware of that were going wrong in your body that God fixed before you even got the diagnosis. So we've, we've experienced minimally spiritual healing from the Lord. Many could say I've also experienced mental renewal and heart renewal and emotional renewal and relational renewal. God's done a whole bunch of stuff in my life. So what's our response to that going to be? Praise him for saving you and worship and follow him, which are essentially the same thing. To worship is to follow. To follow is to worship. So we worship and follow him all the days of our lives and our worship is, in fact, then stimulated by and grounded in the, who God is and his revelation of himself to us and the transformative healing work that he's always done. When you are worshiping in a church or in your home, I would encourage you not to pay exclusive attention to the words on the screen. But as you're singing the words on the screen, make the connections to how those words those phrases have played themselves out in your life. And that'll just bring a, a boost of enth spiritual enthusiasm to you like few things can. So church, in Matthew 28, we receive the Great Commission from Christ. In Mark chapter 7, we see Jesus 
putting the Great Commission into action. So the Great Commission was given to us as an imperative in Matthew 28, but by example, Jesus showed us what it looks like in Mark chapter 7. So there's no confusion. We know what our mission is. If we want to follow Jesus Christ, we need to get about the task of sharing the gospel. So let's follow our Savior by being Great Commission followers. And may God grant us his grace to be able to see much fruit born as we remain faithful to what he's called us to. 